Hello gamers, I'm Pruitt, this is Jim, and this episode of WebDM is one that's... Ah, damn it! Ugh. That's the third one in a row. You always do this whenever you're doing Pruitt's oh, intros. Yeah, yeah. And you knocked over Trav's mini. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. Um, oh, oh, Travis! Travis, uh, Travis, God, give me the help action, yeah? Unfortunately, he did say he was going to get coffee, so he's not here. That's right, that's right. Okay, Pruitt's good at this, right? I, I can't get a hint or anything? Yes, but that is DM knowledge, so I can't... Well, let me see here. We've got this and, oh, I think I got inspiration. I, I've got inspiration, right? Uh, yeah. Hang on. Yes, you did make an inspiration pun earlier in the session. Oh yes, inspiration. Y yeah, that one. All right, all right, time to nail this WebDM intro. All right, Jim, so we're gonna be doing this show like we always do, but it's gonna be on metagaming, right? So let's just, <laughs> let's just talk about it for a second. Okay. Or, oh wait, no, we should just get into it. You wanna get into it? I mean, haven't we already though? We are, are we, we just, into it? Are we meta showing? I don't know anymore. Uh, I don't, this, I is, don't this is the point where I don't, uh -huh. I don't know when the cameras get turned on. I exactly. don't know when. Well, it doesn't matter because it's all, really know how because I isn't here. it all the same thing really? Is it well? For one, yeah, the simulation and the and reality are the uh -huh. same. So the game and reality must be the same. That's why there's no definition uh, about metagaming that makes sense because there is no such thing as metagaming, and yet the entire game is a metagame. So how would you define metagaming? In character versus out of character knowledge, using mm -hmm. that out of character knowledge either from a character or an NPC or something to influence the game world to make a decision or something. Yeah. And I just like to state up front at the beginning of the show that that definition is bullshit. Like just forget it, throw it out the window, and. Forget Forget it. There's a narrow criteria for it that, that I have personally, which is like, if everyone at your table, DM every player is like, listen, we want a hard and fast boundary between what is in character knowledge and what is out of character knowledge, and all five, six, seven, 20 of us, whatever, agree to it. That's one thing. Right. That's a table rule that you are coming up for yourself. But looking at metagaming, it's just a bunch of people who are complaining about these very petty, very little things that mm -hmm. I'm here to tell you. As soon as you give up wanting to control that kind of player decision making, the game will just be so much better. <laughs> it yeah. just like takes a load off and eases so many problems that become like real sticking points between dungeon masters and players. And I get it. There are dungeon masters who want a specific immersive experience and mm -hmm. there are players who also want that specific immersive ex experience and saying like, you know, how in the world does my character know XYZ? How in the world does the villain know this thing that they shouldn't know? That they want justification for that. They want there to be a, a, a reason for it and just casual metagaming. It really gets under their skin. You need to work that out with your group. That is an out of character problem. Do not punish your players for it, do not whatever. So it's all time for us to take a deep breath right, right. and relax. Metagaming yeah. is not a problem. Yeah, well, I mean, it doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be a problem. Why don't we recognize some types of metagaming? Sure, 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 right. As we move forward and then we can kind of unpack like, what could be a problem, what couldn't, what's just right. like, you just gotta let that go, man. Some things you gotta let that go, um, right? What are some types of metagaming? So there's the traditional version, right? Like using out of character knowledge for in character purposes, and that applies to players and dungeon masters, right? Mm -hmm. Like this is a, a thing. Um, but there's also a more expansive version of metagaming that's like the social contract of your game is a metagame. If you have a social contract that says, our party is an adventuring party, they stick together. Yeah. They don't fight each other. They don't try to stab each other in the back. They yeah. don't try to undermine each other. That's a metagame. You, that, is a, that is a decision that you made out of game that's impacting in-game decisions, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think like that's number one. There's a lot of groups that have something like that. So yeah. I, I, part of what I want to do with the episode is show people that number one, you guys are metagaming all over the place. Yeah. There's so much metagaming going on in Dungeons and Dragons and other RPGs that R right. And, to and, get and mad and, about it. Is and weird. someone <laughs> might say as a counterpoint, like, well, you should just do that because people would would do that so they could get along. But if you're playing like a rogue that steals shit, why aren't you stealing from the people like? right around you. It'd be pretty easy, wouldn't it? Right. I mean, There's in-character justifications for it, but not always, right? So but it's because you've yeah. all decided, because you're all players, and we all want to get along, and we want to keep playing this game. Yeah. There's shared storytelling techniques and cooperative world building or collaborative world building, mm -hmm. uh, especially things like a social scene where the dungeon master kind of lays the broad terms for what this social encounter is going to be like, and yeah. then the players have a lot more uh, control over setting the terms of what's in that scene. 
I, sometimes you see DMs do it with like establishing a, a sense of place, mm -hmm. and they'll tell the players like, okay, you guys see X, Y, and Z. Tell me, number one, how your character reacts. Do they see anything that interests them? Like you're giving players some control to uh, be the author in that scene. And that's a technique and a tool you can use that is a metagame technique, right? The yeah. player's stepping out from their character just a little bit to describe something that's happening in the game Well, and world. deciding what would be good for their character to see in that. Yeah, what do you see that might interest you? Like, well, is there a thing there? My guy's always looking for these things. Yeah. You just metagame. There's things like group character creation. Oh, is yeah. a, you're metagaming at that point. If you sat down and your dungeon master said, hey, I'm running Curse of Strahd, and you go, sweet, I'm going to play a paladin, because paladins are really useful against undead, and this is whole thing is about vampires and werewolves, and other and werewolves aren't undead, but you can see what I mean. Um, don't at me. And <laughs> there's, there's a... Don't at me, bro. <laughs> you're metagaming in those moments. And if uh -huh. it's... Like for dungeon masters, and you see it sometimes, they get obsessive about stamping out metagaming. Yeah. You're just kind of like, then why didn't you just present everyone with pre generated randomly rolled characters? Because, like, your players are always using out of character knowledge to mm -hmm. play the game that they are playing. They are deciding when to use their character abilities, they are deciding when to use the, the, the resources that they have, and not all of those are in character decisions. Yeah. They're, they're manipulating the pieces of a game. Yeah. Well, yeah, because, I mean, this happens in other games. Right. Right? The one that I'm thinking of the most is Magic, right? Mm -hmm. Magic the Gathering, the, the idea of the metagame is is sort of at a tournament or competitive play. You sort of know what decks are popular, what card combos are popular, mm -hmm. what, what other competitors are playing. And yeah. so the metagame is sort of, you can't ignore it. You can't, uh, uh, you know, say like, well, it's not the game, it's the meta game. I can't, you know, I'm, I, you don't make that distinction. You incorporate it into your play experience. I think Dungeons and Dragons and other role playing games are better when you embrace the fact that there is a meta game that exists at your table. The classic example of the troll, you know, how how does your character know that the troll is only vulnerable to fire and acid? There are so many ways that a character might know that. Mm -hmm. in character, but at the bottom line, if it's just like, if the player knows it because the player is a nerd who plays a lot of fantasy RPGs and other things and they just sort of know that that's what you do with fire, or the player is a character that has like a fire or an acid attack, at the end of the day, the player's making a decision to do this, like why try to influence that behavior a certain way just to get a certain outcome? Do you want them to flail ineffectually at a monster that they can't kill while they get resentful of you and then leave the game angry? Like, is that what we want here? It's kind of a forced immersion. Right. So in, yes. in other words, so you're just like holding their head underwater. Like, yeah. That, point, <laughs> right. that's, that is what that's called, isn't it? Yeah. Drowning, I yeah, think, is what drowning. you're talking about. Um, <laughs> knowledge is passed down. Like, people know like certain things like that. So if the player happens to know, you know, eh. Now, right. if it's a demon from like the eighth layer of the abyss that nobody's ever seen before right, that's but nice. that one player happened to fight one in the previous campaign yeah. that's something a little bit different so this is we're getting right? into territory where there are groups and there are people that want to play experience where that level of in character and out of character knowledge it, there's a they clear line right because they want a very emotion er, emotion an immersive experience <laughs> a drowning ex they want a mutually My immersion they want mutual consensual Sorry. drowning yeah is what they want <laughs> in the RP. We're going to talk about some techniques just a minute to make sure that those boundaries are firmly established, but too often what I see online and in online communities and forums and all these others is like a dungeon master complaining about metagaming. I'm here to tell you I have rarely seen players complain about metagaming. I've seen a lot of players complain that decisions that they made were overruled because the DM thought they were metagaming. And, and it seems like to me that there's a, a sense of control that's at play and the dungeon master just needs to be like, hey, yeah, I, it does does it, what does it matter if you overcame my troll encounter that I thought was going to be super awesome? It's just like, think of a better encounter, DM. Like, you can do it. It's possible. <laughs> yeah. You know, you're, you're, the entire uh, tension in your campaign shouldn't hang on, you know, the players not, or the characters not knowing what a troll is. Or just reskin that troll. We're using the troll example, I think, because it's the most common one that gets brought up here, but there are others that get used, mm -hmm. um, and, and there are ways, there are ways to address them. And, you know, before the too many, we get too many <laughs> comments. Otherwise, there is such a thing as bad metagaming, which we will talk about as well. What are some of the DM considerations to take into to account mm -hmm, to mm -hmm. maybe be a little bit, maybe a little more comfortable, or how to think about their monsters to 
to be okay with metagaming. Right. So we're, we're assuming here that like the social contract is we want a hard and fast line between uh, in-character and out-of-character knowledge. So for Dungeon Masters, it's worth thinking about the physics of your world and how all of the game elements work with that. I'm thinking of like some of the more common sources of friction between player and Dungeon Master where you know, you see Dungeon Masters use the, this is in character, this is out of character knowledge, your character wouldn't know that, um, are things like magic. Particularly in, a, in game systems like traditional fantasy and, and Dungeons and Dragons and other mainstream games, magic is usually very precise. If my fireball always fills the same volume every time. Yeah, 20 foot radius. Right, then how radius. come my, my caster isn't like a, you know, a genius with placing it? Maybe they're not an evoker, so they're not a savant at placing their fireballs. But they do know where it bursts, the limits of it. They can fire their rays of frost and scorching into melee without having to worry about it in the same way that an archer. If you want magic to be unpredictable or you're resentful that a player is like using the precision of spells to be like, yeah, I'm going to get just the enemies, fireball's going to stop just short mm -hmm. of my allies. Like, is, is that not a legitimate thing? If you don't want it to be, then you need to change the way the spell works. And you need to let the players know before they even start playing that you have changed magic so that it is more unpredictable, so that you can introduce an element of uncertainty if that's the kind of game you want. You need to be prepared for the players to go, no thank you, we don't want to play a magic user because we don't want unpredictable magic. I mean, if they wanted that, they would play a wild sword. That's built into the game, like right. that uncertainty. The knowledge of how magic works, knowledge of the monsters, all of these things help set the foundations for what the characters know, what the, uh, what the world is like. And if that information is important to your group, having a solid understanding of how the rules interact with your game world is going to really help with um, you know with making sure that that line isn't crossed but it applies to the dungeon master as well right like your enemies your your npcs are subject to those same conditions as well. I'm pretty sure it's happened to you in a game before. Uh, I mean, I've had a DM in the past that didn't really like that much metagaming, yet every time we fought them, like, they knew exactly our tactics. Yeah. And it's like, we've never fought this group of enemies. How do they know exactly what right. we're going to do? When you're on the other side of the screen and you're a player with a dungeon master who's, like, hardcore against metagaming and, like, don't, no, no table, no talking between rounds of, of combat, no things like this, it's just like, then it needs to be the same for you. And that what that means is that if the enemy knows something about the party they otherwise wouldn't know, there is a game effect in play. There's a scry spell being used. There's a, a magical spy or something like that. Now the players can do something about that. Now I find that style of play very engaging. And I try very hard to justify the knowledge that my enemies have of what's going on with the party. Mm -hmm. Because that means the party can do something about it. They can take countermeasures to make sure that the enemies don't get that information. That's because I like playing in that style. But there are DMs out there who are like, oh yeah, I'm, I'm just going to, you know, I automatically know what the, uh, you know, the party's capable of and I'm designing my combat encounters with that in mind. Well, maybe that game style works because the players want to be challenged to, the, to their limits every fight. And they want enemies that are tailor-made for, for them so that they can be challenged in combat because that's why they're playing the game. That's yeah. one thing. Using it as a bludgeon against other players who aren't interested in that is entirely different. Is there a point that you decide what level of metagaming that you engage in? Like, or how does the DM decide what level? Like, in terms of like the metagaming that they do? Yeah. I think like, that's all part of the social contract that either is explicit Mm -hmm. or that emerges because you've played together long enough that your mm -hmm. styles grow together and merge. You know, yeah. the social contract is one of those things where maybe if you're playing with a new group of people that you've never played with before, you lay this out in a session zero, like, hey guys, this is the style of dungeon master I am. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to ask you guys some questions to get a good feel for like what, you know, what style of games you like. But for me, you know, I, I always sort of, because we played together so long and because our home group played together so long, our gaming styles sort of merged together and we developed practices of play over time that n nothing was like so far out of bounds that mm -hmm. another player was like, hey, we're, this thing's cropped up that we're doing. It's like, I, I, I don't like it. Yeah, yeah. So we kind of just like, a social contract emerged from the fact that we played together for so long. So right. there's different ways that a social contract can can come about. And it maybe it's explicit, maybe it's implicit, mm -hmm. maybe you've never thought about it at all, but there's some unwritten, unspoken rule of, of, of something at your table that keeps the game flowing and keeps the game going together. And if you've never talked about it, if you've never taken the chance to 
like think about the social contract of your table and just the unspoken rules that, that exist, no PVP, or we're not gonna steal magic items from each other, then maybe it's time to think about that and mm -hmm. talk to your group about it uh, if you think there's a problem. Jim, is there is there anything that DMs do metagame-wise that just goes too far for you? Like, what's yeah. the line for you where I, you're just like, <laughs> guys, I so I, there's two for me. Um, well, actually, there's more than two. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's so, never just <laughs> there's two. never just the Come two. On. So the first two are are the not knowing what the monster does. Yeah. It's like, guys, if this is a traditional fantasy world, then why aren't there nursery rhymes about what trolls are like? Why aren't there myths and fables and folk tales and folk wisdom and things that people pass down? Like for, for there's a nursery rhyme that exists in 2018 that warns us against the black death. Right, like th that's <laughs> like these are art cultural artifacts that are passed down, but they they have their source in in something real. So like in your fantasy world, how come there is not cultural knowledge of how certain monsters work that gives the party an out? If you're a dungeon master who's wanting to maintain a, a sharp line between in character and out of character knowledge, and your players are on board, then make sure you have firmly established the player or the characters know this about the monsters. And it's not like go read the monster manual because that's a player behavior that you really should kind of stop. Yeah. Uh, but, but it is a case of like, you're, you know, rural peasants in Faerun. You know all about different kinds. You know that goblins are bad news. Don't go anywhere near them. They, they're at best a nuisance and at worst quite deadly. There are giant spiders in the forests and things underground that will come and get you. There are dragons that fly around here and not even just dragons. There are griffins, hippogriffs and wyverns and yeah. all sorts of things. Like the, the world is filled with monsters Monsters. Why don't you know the most common ones in your area? Mm -hmm. Right, that's one. That's one thing that gets me. And so there's a lot of arguments about like, how would yeah. you know about this one thing? Red on black, friend of Jack. Exactly. Right. There you go. Right. <laughs> Come on. Anyway, the other it's one. Coral snakes, everyone. If you didn't know that, it's right coral. On. Coral. Uh, <laughs> the other one for me is the is the um, prompting uh, a player. I who, touched the thing. Uh, are you sure? <laughs> are you sure? <laughs> Whoa, well, it, it, or sometimes it's, it looks like this. I touch the thing. Scribble, 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 scribble. Okay, guys, what do you do? I touch the thing. Okay, you do this. You do this. What did you say you do again? <laughs> and it's just this a stalling. And uh, and usually what happens here is you've put something in your game that you realize too late mm -hmm. is going to be really bad news. Yeah. And now you're prompting the party to do like, are you sure? And and it's it's a prompt that you subtly send out that you want the player to pick up on to be like, yeah. oh, the dungeon master is yeah. asking me if I'm sure. Maybe I should second guess myself. Yeah. That's some bad metagaming. Yeah, don't be Regis. Right. <laughs> is that your final answer? <laughs> is that your final answer? Right. That's just two things going on here. Yeah. If you put something in your game that can wipe out your party because of just looking under a rock or something like that, then that's on you. You should not have put that in your game if you weren't willing to see the consequences of that through. And if you're going to at least warn them or at least <laughs> warn them, at yeah. least put warning signs. Is this an ultra deadly trap? Why aren't there corpses around here. Everywhere. <laughs> I'll give you an example from the Wizards of the Coast product, and it's one of my favorite parts of, of any of their products that they've had. There's a, a this is spoilers for the Amber Temple uh, in Curse of uh, Strahd. There is a, a magic, there's a magic statue there that has mm -hmm. a sympathy effect on it. Sympathy is like a seventh or eighth level spell. It's pretty powerful. It makes you be attracted to a certain object or place. And it just, you can see around the statue are several desiccated bodies of people who are just kneeling. And so you know something's wrong here. These are dead, like partially mummified bodies. They're just kneeling there. You can get close, you can examine them. They have faces that are twisted in agony, you know, clutching their stomachs in hunger pains. You know something's going on. This is a deadly trap. Mm -hmm. Most likely it will kill your character if they get stuck here and they cannot magically leave, particularly if they're by themselves, right? Yeah. But you've warned the party that something's up here and it's a good example of that kind of trap in which i thought that was very clever and i and when i when we discovered it in play your players or veteran players certainly are going to be like yeah we're not going anywhere near that but because you've given them clues they can use a trap like that against their own enemies they can use it for their own purposes it's an element of play that you've clearly communicated the danger of and now it's on the party to see how much they want to test that danger yeah and if they push their luck Sorry, your character's dead, or your character's debilitated, or driven insane, or shunted yeah. to another dimension, or whatever it is. Yeah, sometimes if you take a ride on a tiger, you're going to get bit. Right, you know? <laughs> right. But the, the other thing about the Are You Sure is that, it, it, to me, I have never, I rarely see 
a player that goes like, oh, I guess I'm not sure I should stop. I usually see a player that goes, why are you trying to undermine what I want to do? Yes, I touch the thing. Yes, I pull the door open. Mm -hmm. Yes, I do this. Yes, I do that. And then it becomes a, 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 you know, bullshit power play between two people at which the only answer is for one of you to walk away. You know, like, it's just, it, just stop it. Come on. The final one for me about the Dungeon Masters, and to me, this is perhaps the biggest one. It's the using, you know, a player metagaming as an excuse to punish their character or their player. If metagaming is a problem for you, then you need to talk about it like an adult, like, a, like, an, like an emotionally mature person with the other people around you. Mm -hmm instead of seeking to punish them. And I'm. this is the most common thing that I see on message boards and forums and all kinds of things is dungeon masters going like, how do I punish my players for metagaming? It's like all of these people talking about, well, you could do this and that and this. It's like, Dock them experience, take their stuff. What is wrong with you? Yeah. Now, for one, this was present in the hobby from the earliest ages. The first uh, edition DMG includes punishing players and characters for certain behaviors. And Gygax was wrong to include it in that one and it's wrong to do it now. For all the, the brilliance of, of, of some of the the founders of the hobby, they were not perfect saints of gaming. You know, they were wrong on a great many things. <laughs> Uh, but, it, you know, you, so I can see where it enters in. It enters into the, the common pool of wisdom about how you should run these games. And punishing metagaming behavior is one of those things that creeps up, but is just like, do not do it. And if you're, a, if, if you're a player who experiences this, your reaction should be something like, hey, why are you doing this? Mm -hmm. And if it keeps up, I'm going to leave. I mean, we could go into like all different kinds of examples of adversarial DMing and, and using, uh, you know, punishing people for, for certain behaviors in game. Yeah, yeah. The thing is, is I can, I can hear like counterpoints like, well, what if I have a player that's constantly like, well, telling another player like what spell they should use at that exact moment. It's like, well, that to me, that's not metagaming. That player's being a dick. <laughs> like Unless you're trying to tell someone how to play their character right you know it's like well no no, no. that's a different behavior you need to stop yes they might be metagaming but right. the heart of what they're doing yeah. is a wholly different behavior it's a wholly different behavior and this is assuming that the advice isn't wanted right <laughs> that the other that the other yeah. player might be like hey i've never played a cleric before you pl you usually play all our clerics right. can you help me pick my yeah. spells and then oh and a bless would be good right a now a bless would be great right now oh do you really you know what spiritual weapon is a great second level spell those are the kinds of things attack, you know? right you know those are the kinds of things that's how new players learn the game is when they have veteran players next to them who are willing to mm -hmm. help them into the hobby right and so we shouldn't try to stamp that out that again assuming the the advice is, uh, is you know appreciated and wanted. asked for yeah right the game is a collaborative game and whether you're a storyteller deep mm -hmm. immersion you want the emotional resonance of, of exploring a character arc in a complex world that your dungeon master creates or you're here to like just beer and pretzels uh, kick down the door and play some Dungeons and Dragons like the point of it is to collaborate with each other and to talk and like talking during combat coordinating strategy oh yeah is another one of those where it's like oh my god let them do it I've had DMs that were like okay no 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 stop the cross talk and yeah. I'm like People talk during combat. I've seen all the movies. They do it all the time. <laughs> they shout each other. They, they shout each other. Yeah. They, they compare kills. They right. they say, hey, can you do this? And then I'm going to do that. It's called strategy tactics. Yep. Now, the thing is, if they're doing it, they're doing it out loud. Right. The enemies can hear what yes. they're doing. I'm like, yeah, go ahead and do it. Because your enemies are sitting here listening to you coordinate out yeah. loud. Yeah. That's why I allow it. Right, which is also why the party should have a secret language that only they know. Mm -hmm. uh, or or, <laughs> or a telepathic te bond. A rarest telepathic bond ASAP. ASAP, uh, yeah. You know. As soon as you can. That's like the best thing, because then who gives right. a shit? But it enhances the game when you allow uh, the entire party to get together, particularly in combat. This is one of the reasons I like simultaneous group initiative, is because you can just say, you guys go. You're going to tell me what order you go in oh, and yeah. what you're doing. And now the party gets together. They put their heads together. Number one, for those players who have difficulty knowing what to do on their combat round, mm -hmm. they now have some assistance and can bounce ideas off people. They don't feel like yep. the spotlight's on them. And now they're like, oh, what do I do? They're now part of a group and can take suggestions, can mm -hmm. offer suggestions without the spotlight being on them. So yeah. That's one thing that it does. But us, it's just, it's a more enjoyable way to play. And I yeah. find it actually speeds things up. Oh, it does. Because, yeah, when you got your bard, your cleric, and everybody in there, the bard hits the bard hits them with, with, a, uh, with fairy fire, and the cleric goes in and hits them with a bane, and then yeah. you run in and your fighters attack. Yeah. And then, you know. 
even even Wizard if you're doing mops like up. traditional initiative of like you yeah. know you know uh, I forget what they call the the term official term it is but you know like Dungeons and Dragons style initiative even like that if you allow for collaboration and talk with you know between the characters and the players usually it will speed up combat mm -hmm. um, but at like the same time Pruitt's saying uh, they are speaking in character and the bad guys will hear them and may adapt to those circumstances gotta watch that battle banter yeah gotta watch the battle banter is there player metagaming that should be avoided there is player metagaming that should be avoided if you're playing through a published adventure don't go buy the adventure and read it that's a that's a bad metagaming page. Don't go to your game store and just like peruse through Tomb yeah. of Annihilation. Don't, don't, <laughs> don't be a Pierce Hawthorne. Right. Go, <laughs> what does your player want to do? So many things. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you know, don't look at your DM's notes. If you feel the need to gain that level of advantage, yeah. then something else is going on. Yeah. And you might need to take a step back and, and realize that maybe you're too invested in something if you feel like you need to win, you need to cheat to win. Yeah, yeah win at all costs. Right, win at all costs. Or you're playing some bizarre, hyper-competitive version of D&D, &D, in which case the Dungeon Master should lock up their notes better. But I don't know that that thing actually exists. <laughs> and I think it's probably more of a case of, you, you know, a, a player feeling a need to, like win mm -hmm. because of e they either have an adversarial DM and, yeah. and they are resentful of that or worried or they want the game to go on because they like playing but they don't want to con you know confront the adversarial DM uh -huh. but it's just like those are all kinds of behaviors that, that those those are the things that lead to the gaming horror stories that you read about you could also have a DM like me who just shows players their map and just like here's the map I have you know yeah. you can look at it for like five seconds and then, <laughs> and then it's mine again so we you're talking about that, that kind of adversarial relationship in the game that can lead to like like you said hyper competitive D&D &D that, that resembles something like uh, now I want to see D&D &D from the producers of Saw right <laughs> where the DM and the players are just like they're literally at each other's throats, each other's throats. You know? yeah I, I've been at tables like that before and it's not fun and I've been that DM before with certain players where I've just been like oh I gotta just Get this guy, yeah, and you just and then like every you start scrutinizing every little thing they do is like, how did you know that? What are you doing? How did you get that spell? Where did you switch that? Are you sure you didn't switch that after the long rest? Trust me, if you just like fucking let all that go, and just be like, I don't fucking care, man. Just do what you're gonna do. Like we're not, <laughs> we're not like this is a because it's an elf game, and I know that people's experiences at the table can can really impact their lives. But at the same time, it's like it's an elf game, and we shouldn't be that invested that you feel the need to like cheat at that level. So that's one style of player metagaming. It's like you should please cut that out. There's another kind of like style where if the DM makes a mistake that the the player wants to exploit that mistake. That's kind of the same way. So like in this case it would be uh, you know, forgetting I, certain damage. Forgetting certain damage that your character would have taken automatically or or like, you know, were they subject to a spell that the DM forgot about. I, the reason why I bring this up is because this is an opportunity as a player for you to speak up and say, "Hey DM, you you forgot to make that attack against me. You said that the monster was attacking, you got distracted and then and then you moved on. You've now shown your dungeon master that you're trust that you're fucking trustworthy, right? Like that you're right. you're here to play the game fairly. An obsessive adherence to the rules as written in the game and that I find is is just as problematic, but at the same time we do agree to play to the rules of the game and if if one something gets skipped over because the dungeon dungeon master has a lot on their plate they are the dungeon master they're usually doing a shit ton of stuff and all you're worried about is your one character if they forget something and you speak up then that shows the dungeon master that like hey i can trust this player they're not trying to gain every advantage on me and you can do some amazing fucking gaming if there is a strong bond of trust between players and dungeon masters Mm -hmm. it if if the, the bonds of trust there are that everyone's playing fairly, no one's out to screw someone else over, no one's out to take out their their personal vendettas at the gaming table or something like that, then, my God, all sorts of things open up. All those things that you hear about where you're like, never do this type of gaming, never play an evil campaign. I'm like, sure you can. Like, what the fuck? Of course you can, if you trust the people you play with. We had a great time during. We ours. had a great time. I, evil, evil campaigns are fun as shit, but I wouldn't play one with people I didn't trust. Um, yeah. And so, like, that's an opportunity as a player. If you instead say, I, "I'm, I'm not going to say anything," I, I'm even though I'm in range of spiritual guardians or that fire shield spell or whatever mm -hmm. the fuck it is, I'm not gonna. Yeah, because just the, not going to say anything. Because the DM's like a T Rex, and as long as you don't move and say anything, you know, right, then you're not going to get damage. squashed. <laughs> yeah, I understand where those behaviors come from. They, a lot of this stems from adversarial DMing. 
Mm -hmm. um, but if you want to start building a bond of trust with your dungeon master, then making sure that the rules that would apply to your character, even if they're detrimental, are applied fairly. Um, and not not using uh, you know the DM's distraction yeah. or something like that. Well, and also because what that will lead to is in the future, if you say cast hex or hunter's mark, mm -hmm. and you forgot to do all your hunter's mark damage, yeah. and you hit and you threw, rolled your damage, and then it's the next person start. Oh crap! I forgot to roll my hunter's mark. Oh, go ahead and roll it because you did it. Because you did it. it. The damage was done. We just didn't write it down. We just didn't write it down. Like, but your DM is more likely to go. Oh yeah, go ahead and roll that d6. Yeah, go ahead you and know? roll that. As opposed to the like, nope, sorry, you're sorry, you over. missed it because they're gonna it. think back. Like, yeah, it's spiritual yeah. guardians, mother. <laughs> right, and that's <laughs> where resentment builds uh -huh. up and bad gaming experiences start to yep. creep in when people just like we're getting very specific on the don't be. This is like all of the shit that's listed under don't be a dick. Yeah, like this, we're we're gonna like gonna go deep into some of these. So, uh, in terms deep, of not dicking, <laughs> deep, sorry, right. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Cut off the rails now. <laughs> you can make sure that you don't cross over a line if in that moment of, of maybe session zero or whenever your, your, your group has that metagame talk of, okay, what is and isn't in and out of character knowledge? What can I use and bring to the table to, uh, to play? Those are moments where you can establish, you know, you might say something like, yeah, Dungeon Master, my, my wizard is background, like they're far traveled, they're, they're, they're widely read, the, they know on a lot of things. Like, what does that mean? What do I know about the place that I'm in? You know, mm -hmm. seek these answers out before they become problems in the moment, mm -hmm. and and try to kind of work through some of these things. Number one, working through them before they become problems is another way to build trust between the dungeon master and the player. It's another way to establish that this is the boundary of what we consider acceptable play versus unacceptable play. It gives you a freedom once you know where the limits are. Then you know how much room you have to roam around in, and consequently dungeon masters need to be willing to give you a large <laughs> enough space that you feel like it's a fun game to play in and if they're yeah. like all restricted about what they want out of the game because they're sort of worried about metagaming in some weird mm -hmm. way yeah. um, then then that's a red flag and, and maybe that's something that if you can't work it out then you just might not be with the right group so uh, any any final thoughts there on metagaming metagaming that I see from players sometimes that, that sometimes gets them into trouble particularly if you have a dungeon master who's like I don't balance my encounters there's gonna be stuff here that is very dangerous is players thinking that there's always a solution and that every fight is winnable. Uh, and yeah. it, particularly, this can happen if you've got, you know, there are certain styles of traditional role-playing games, uh, and, and uh, you know, sometimes it's Dungeons & Dragons, where it's assumed that the party wins, that fights are going to be fair, uh, and for the most part, that, that fights will be winnable. And that there, if there's a trap or a puzzle somewhere, that there is an obvious solution that, that, that's at hand. I find this is more typical in newer players than, than in veteran players, but I've also seen plenty of veteran players who've only ever played in this style that don't. And so the metagaming that occurs there is they come, they're playing with a dungeon master who is not like that, who uses unbalanced encounters. And trust me, unbalanced encounters are infinitely more fun than balanced encounters. And has things in their dungeon that are, are deadly and dangerous or, or, or just unsolvable. Like I, I like to put things in my dungeons that have no obvious solution. It's just like, I don't know how you're going to get past this obstacle. Good luck. And, and the point of it is, is for the players to get their heads together, look at what resources they have, and to figure something out. And if they can't come up with a solution then, then they'll have to come back with one that works. Yeah, once you get a key card for that door. Right, but it doesn't need necessarily be a key card. You could disintegrate the door or, or right, tunnel yeah, around it or then, <laughs> demolish the building. Or... <laughs> Sorry, I meant to put, say, key card right, in, in quotes. Saying. But... You know, in, in in Metroid and games like that, there's always, like, sometimes there's just a door. It's like, well, you just can't do that right now, and that's yeah, fine. Yeah. Yeah. You need to be okay with that. You need to be okay with that. But it's it's the players who should, should be like, well, there is a trap there, so there must be a way around it. And there must That's be a, something in there. And there must be something in there. That is a style of metagame thinking that is can lead to a lot of frustrating moments where, and, and you know, and when it happens in, in my games, I usually immediately, once I spot it, I'm kind of like, just so you know, this may be an unsolvable puzzle. Keep that in mind, and and then move on. But I'm opening the door and le or leaving the door open to be surprised by the player that once they know it's not a conventional puzzle or trap or challenge or whatever, that they might go, well, I've got this thing that can bypass it that maybe the DM forgot about. In which case, it's like that's 
sweet. I'm, I'm, I'm glad to be surprised. I like being surprised as a dungeon master. If I'm never surprised, then the game is fucking boring. Right. <laughs> you know, so I, I, like, I like those moments. That's why I include challenges that have no obvious solution to them or, or no, uh, you know, no, no button that can be pushed to, to you know, to, to continue forward. Um, so that's that's kind of one that I that I would see, particularly you know as, as more and more people join the hobby and as newer and newer players join, um, you know they'll start encountering different play styles and different uh, different groups and and a lot of these things that we're describing here in, in the metagaming show are just matters of taste and you know the 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 kind of the frantic sort of like. I've got to punish my players for metagaming is one of those things where it's like, you guys need to cut that out. Like, Dungeon Masters, we need to, we need to stop this. There's nothing wrong with metagaming. Mm -hmm. If establishing a firm line between in-character and out-of-character knowledge is important, then that's something you need to talk to your group about. Mm -hmm. But it's not something you need to punish them for. It's not something you need to lose your mind over. It's okay. Mm -hmm. And the game is really very fun on the other side when you're just like, Ah, it's, it's just don't look at my map unless yeah. I show it to you. Please don't read the adventure. Yeah, you know, uh, and I trust you not to. And we're gonna have some great gaming. And there's gonna be a lot of table talk. There's gonna be a lot of meta gaming that goes on, and it's gonna enhance the game. It's going to make it better. It's metagaming, right? <laughs> I think so. I mean, so. I mean at, at playing 21. Playing tw yeah, playing blackjack. You're, you're yeah. counting cards to keep keep track of everything that's going on and all the possible resources uh -huh, uh -huh. in the encounter, right? Sure, I, I guess I can see that as right? a metagame. Yeah, yeah. But of course, there's money on the line, and the DM, this in this it's case, the, the dealer, the <laughs> <Yeah>. house, <laughs> doesn't want you to do that. No. So yeah, I mean, I can see that there. And you know, if you if there was something like competitive. Dungeon, like I would, it, here's a situation in which I would be hardcore about metagaming. PvP combat. Oh yeah. When when PvP combat happens, and I don't mind it if it happens, and it, as long as it doesn't look like one of the players is like, "What the fuck is going on?" Mm -hmm. <laughs> as long as Why it doesn't are they look killing like me? that, Why are they killing then I will me? then I will allow a limited degree of PvP. More than likely, because I trust the players not to screw this up and and mm -hmm. you know make a big deal and yeah. sort of make a big problem. And sometimes they kill each other. And occasionally they kill each other, uh, and, it, and it, it, it enriches the, uh, the the narrative that we're building. Yeah. Um, I have fucking forgot where I was going with it, but I, it's just. I think it, the if, point was that Will hates my characters. Will, <laughs> uh, yeah. I think it's it's more like if you're doing PvP, then then yes, yeah. uh, you know, establishing firmly what the two play, what the two characters know about each other, which is probably a lot if they've been adventuring together for a while. Um, is is going to be important if only because um, you want to make sure that you know. Yeah, I don't know. This is we could do a whole little mini thing on how to how to successfully run PvP, but yeah. it's I, I I try to keep metagaming under control in PvP combat. Yeah, yeah. Marvel Universe. 